Before I start the real proof uh, of Stone Weierstrass, I first want to do a lemma which shows me that in a situation when I have uh, a closed unital subalgebra, uh, that this really has to contain quite a bit of elements. Huh? I mean, uh, it, it somehow may, maybe the amazing point is that it seems we are not requiring much about our A, so it seems A could be quite small, maybe there are not many elements there, huh? we only have the constant functions, uh, and then uh, yeah, we also have some functions which separate points, huh? but of course we have to construct other functions in a set and how do we get them? Huh? And that's the following lemma that actually in such a setting uh, actually we have quite a bit quite a bit of uh, properties which tells us that, that, there are, uh, yeah, that there are additional elements in our algebra. Huh? Okay. So let me just look on the situation where I have a subset of C of K, uh, which is closed and unital. Be closed and a unital subalgebra. Now at the moment I'm not caring about whether it separates points or not, because I'm more concerned with the question, if I have some elements in A, can I get other elements? Huh? So I mean, how can I build new elements in A out of given elements? Just by knowing that it's closed and the unital subalgebra, which, which looks a bit uh, weak. Huh? Okay, but here are my claims. So namely, uh, yeah, so what I really want is that if I have elements there, that I can take the minimum or the maximum of those two functions. Huh? That's really what I'm going to use in stone Weierstrass. Uh, so if I have two functions, I can take minimum and maximum of them. Okay, minimum and maximum is a bit not so clear how I should get this in algebraic terms, uh, but minimum and maximum you can get by the absolute value of the sum and the difference, and the absolute value you can get by taking a square root of a positive function. No? In the square root, then we are somehow close to an analytic uh, formulation. Uh, and so that's actually uh, what we really have to see, that if I have a function in A, which is positive, uh, so this means pointwise positive, uh, it's positive at any point, then I can take the square root, uh, so the square root of a positive function is, of, co uh, of, of a continuous function is of course continuous, but I'm claiming this is now also in A. Uh, okay, and I'm doing this because actually what I want is that if I have an element in A, I want that the absolute value is in A, uh, again I take pointwise the absolute value, and then from this I can get what I really want, that if I have two functions in A, then the minimum and the maximum of them, the minimum of F and G is in A, and the maximum of F and G is in A. Uh, again, this is pointwise. So I mean for each point x, I'm taking the minimum of f of x and g of x. Uh, so at some points I take the function f, at some other points I take the function g, uh, according to which, which, which is the, uh, the smaller one or the larger one. Okay, so that, that's really what I want. Uh, okay, and yeah, why do I claiming the other guys? Because this here follows from the other ones. Uh, so, let, so let us do the proof. So namely, first of all, I can write, express uh, the absolute value in terms of the square root. Uh, so namely, the absolute value of f I can write as the square root of f squared. Uh, I have here real valued functions. Uh, so if I take uh, f squared, I'm throwing away the sign, and then I take the square root, so I get the, the absolute value of f. Okay, and if I have... Uh, absolute value, then I can write the minimum and the maximum of my two functions in terms of the of the absolute value. Uh, so namely the minimum of f and g is one half of f plus g minus absolute value of f minus g. Uh, so again, this, this is pointwise. Uh, so this is just a, a statement about real numbers. So namely the minimum of this and this number can be written in this form. Uh, and this is, this is trivial because if f is the bigger one, 
uh, then of course the minimum should be g, then I get here f minus g, uh, and then this f goes away, I get here g plus g divided by 2 is g. If uh, g is the bigger one, and then the minimum should be f, then this here is not f minus g, but it is minus f minus g. In this case, the g goes away, and I get twice the, the f. Uh, okay, so I can write the minimum in terms of the absolute value, and the maximum in the same way uh, the other way around. So I get here f plus g, but then I'm adding uh, the absolute value of f minus g. Good. Okay, so this means if I have 1, then this implies 2, and this implies 3. Uh, so, and the only thing I really have to show is 1. Uh, so thus, if I have 1, this implies 2, and this implies uh, 3. Uh, thus, to show is just 1. Good. Okay, and so I should consider now an f, which is positive, and I want to see that the square root is also in a. Yeah, and how I do I do this? Of course, I mean, I, I now use analysis, essentially, by writing the, the square root as a Taylor series, uh, and then I'm going back to operations with using uh, the sum and the product, and I know I'm not falling out of my, my thing, but also, also a limit. So I also have to control uh, the limit, but my set A is closed. Huh? So, so I know limits are also there. Huh? And so I, I just have to work this out in the correct way. Huh? So, but the idea is essentially just doing the, the Taylor expansion uh, of the square root and applying this formula in my algebra. Huh? But then uh, in my algebra, I have my norm and everything, and the estimates I'm doing for, for, for checking conversions are the same as I'm doing for the ordinary square root. Good, and of course, the square root, doing a Taylor expansion about zero, is not a good idea, so I should do it about one, and this means I should write my f as one minus something, eh? because f is, bit is, is bigger than, than zero, if I want to write it as 1 minus something, maybe I should <coughs> assume that f uh, is also smaller than 1. Uh, but I can do this by rescaling. <coughs> yeah, okay, so without restriction, I can assume that my f is bigger than 0, of course, but it's also less or equal than 1, because otherwise, I mean, it's bounded, huh? so I can rescale it so that it falls into 0, 1. So consider without restriction, the situation that f is between 0 and 1. Uh, and then, of course, I can write the f as 1 minus g, where g is also between 0 and 1. Uh, I mean, g, I define g just as 1 minus f. Good, and then I'm looking now on the square root of f, so I'm looking on f of t, this is now 1 minus g of t, the square root of this. Uh, and I write now the Taylor expansion of the square root of 1 minus x. Uh, okay, so this has a Taylor expansion, which is 1 minus, and then I get here the other terms in my Taylor expansion. I get some coefficients, which I call a n, and then I get the power of the argument. Huh? And the argument is g t. I mean, this is gt to the 0, this is 1, but here I get gt to the n. Okay, and this a n, the coefficients in the Taylor series expansion of the square root, I mean, one can calculate them explicitly, uh, and maybe I just write it down. Uh, so I need, one needs a little bit of information about this Taylor expansion. Uh, so this a n is actually 1 divided by 2n minus 1, and then I have here 2 minus 2n plus 1, uh, fact, uh, the binomial coefficient 2n minus 1, choose n. Uh, okay, and I mean well, the ec exact form is not important. What is important here is maybe that one can, by using, for example, the uh, Stirling's formula, uh, see that this does not uh, uh, grow too fast. So I can bound this by c times. Uh, n to the minus 3 over 2. 
uh, by Sterling. Uh, for some constant c bigger than zero, which I don't uh, <laughs> don't want to <laughs> be more explicit about. Huh? Okay. Uh, so I mean, it's just general information which which follows from from uh, your real analysis and Taylor analysis. So, so this is not hard, but it's it's also you have to work a little bit for this. But anyhow, I mean, it's we are just going to use this, and so what we are going to do. Uh, so here here we, here we have done pointwise. Uh, Taylor expansion, but now of course what we want is uh, this in a uniform way uh, because I mean our convergence of course is a uniform convergence uh, so we should approximate the function f in a uniform way by those guys here. Uh, okay, and so what I have here is of course that the norm subnorm of the square root of f minus uh, the approximation of the Taylor series here, so namely if I take 1 minus, and I'm summing up to n, n from 1 to capital N, a n times g to the n, that I can estimate this in a uniform way. Huh? Yeah. So namely, uh, this is, okay, I'm subtracting the summation up to n, so I'm left with the rest of the Taylor series starting from n plus 1 up to infinity a n g n absolute value uh, okay now I can estimate this of course by this is less than the sum from n plus 1 to infinity little n running from there a n uh, times okay and here I have g to the n, the norm of g to the n. Hmm? Okay, and I mean the a n's are positive, as you can see from this explicit formula. Uh, so I, I don't need the absolute value for those. Okay, and now the g to the n. I mean here I can really estimate this by g to the power n, where I also use that uh, that the, the, the norm, the subnorm of my continuous functions goes also nicely with the product structure. Uh, so I mean, it <coughs> yeah, it's not the C of k is not just a Banach space, but it's ban a Banach algebra. I can multiply the functions, but the norm also goes nicely with this. Uh, so the subnorm of of the product of two functions is less than the product of the subnorms of the two factors which I'm multiplying. Huh? Okay, so in particular, I mean if I take the subnorm of g to the n, this is less than the subnorm of g, uh, and then taking the power n. Okay, but my function g was a function between 0 and 1, so the subnorm of g is equal to 1, uh, so this thing here is less than 1, uh, and then I'm left here uh, with essentially with, with those a n's. I have to sum the a n's, and the a n's, I have told you here that they go to zero uh, quite fast, uh, or faster than one over n. Uh, so, so, so they are summable. Uh, so this means this guy here, if n is going to infinity, uh, then this this uh, converges to zero. Uh, so what I have here, this is less or equal than c times the sum, and these a n's are less than n to the minus three over two if I'm summing this from m plus 1 to infinity, uh, and n to the minus 3 over 2 is, is summable, so this means this remainder term here goes to 0 if n goes to infinity. Uh, okay, and so this tells me that this approximation of the square root of f by this uh, Taylor series, uh, if n goes to infinity, that is really uh, converges in a uniform norm, uh, in, in the subnorm. Okay, so yeah, what I have here, maybe, uh, yeah, let me erase for this final argument. What I have here is I have an approximation of, yeah, I can erase this here because we are just proving part one. And now is the final step in this argument. Uh, so I have here an approximation in the uniform norm of my 
square root of f by those guys, 1 minus the sum m or n from 1 up to capital N, a n, g to the power n, that this converges if n goes to infinity to the square root of f. Huh? And this is a convergence in ck, yeah? convergence with respect to the subnorm, uh, because that's exactly what this here is showing. Uh, and essentially what, what I'm using here is that the Taylor, yeah, the Taylor expansion <coughs> of 1 minus uh, g, or the Taylor expansion of 1 minus x, uh, so this, this converges on the interval, <coughs> so the, to the radius of convergence of this Taylor series is 1. Uh, so I mean it, it converges between, uh, between 0 and 2. Okay, but Taylor series usually don't tell me what happens at the endpoints. Hmm? Okay, and this this estimate here, this one here, this shows that uh, I also have uh, convergence at the endpoints. Hmm? I have here uniform convergence uh, at the endpoints. So the Taylor series uh, for this square root of one minus x also converges also at the endpoints. Huh? And that's important for my estimate here, so that I can do a uniform estimate, which also includes the endpoints. Huh? Because this g can take on the value 1. Huh? I, I also need this estimate uh, in the case that the g of t is equal to 1. So I need uniform estimates, which do not only work in the open interval from 0 to 2, but in a closed interval. Huh? Okay, But this relies on the fact that the Taylor series for the square root uh, really can be controlled quite well. In particular, those ANs go to zero fast enough so that I have this estimate. Good, but okay, anyhow, so this tells me that I have the uniform convergence of these guys here to those. But these guys here, I mean, they are now using just uh, the unit Hill algebra structure of A. Huh? So, I mean, if G is in A, then G to the N is in A, because if I'm multiplying things in A, they are not falling out. I can multiply it with, with, with numbers. And the one, that's a constant function. The constant function is also there. So I have here a combination uh, which is still in A. Uh, so this guy here for each capital N is in A. Uh, and those elements converge to this function here if N goes to infinity. But A is closed by my assumption. This means uh, the limit of those guys here, each of which is in A, the limit also has to be in A. Uh, so this means that also the square root of F, which is the limit of those guys, has to be in A, uh, since A is closed. Yeah, and that's the end of the proof of this lemma. Uh, so you see, I mean, I can really, uh, by just having the constants, and being able to take powers and sums of elements in A, I can also go to limits if my A is closed, and with this I can also produce the square root of functions, uh, because I just do the Taylor expansion. Uh, I mean, that, that's a general idea in Banach algebras, that I can take Taylor series of elements in my Banach algebra uh, and usually show that they also give me new elements in my Banach algebra uh, just by doing estimates uh, which, which just are like estimates for numbers uh, because uh, what I'm using here is exactly everything which, which I have for, for the ordinary numbers. Okay, so we will come back to those things later when we talk more general about Banach algebras. There we very often do such analytic expansions of functions and this allows us to, to show that we have many elements in our Banach algebra by, by such reasons. Uh, so here we are doing it very concretely for the square root. Good, okay, but so equipped with this lemma, we can then now really go to the proof of uh, Stone-Weierstrass.